Welcome to the show. It's our final makeup day until the next until the next football championship that we win, probably, or a hurricane, either a natural disaster. Uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna move forward with the material as you might expect. Instead, I'm gonna I'm gonna sketch a curve, which is pretty much reviewing all these all this stuff with derivatives. And also um uh, we probably need to look at some trig functions. So here's a function. Um so I'm gonna I'm gonna go follow the steps in my book. And I'm gonna start with the third step, which is a which is my favorite because it's the it's the one that makes my life the easiest. Um, checking for symmetry because this has sides and cosines. It's screaming. Um, it's screaming periodic. Um, what happens when you plug in x plus two pi in there? You get well, you plug it, you plug x plus two pi everywhere, but all the x's are inside inside a sine or a cosine. And adding 360 degrees to an angle doesn't change the sine or the cosine. So this thing repeats every two pi. Um does it repeat every pi? Like maybe, maybe I'm lucky. When you when you add 180 degrees to an angle, the cosine and the sine flip signs. So this is ne negative cosine x, two minus sine x, which is a different function. So I guess I'm not so lucky today. Um, could it be, could it be even or odd? Um, I'm gonna try it because it's easy. You plug in negative X and you remember that cosine is even and sine is odd, which you can realize by drawing the unit circle and thinking about what happens to the cosine and the sine. So the cosine stays the same and the sine flips psychedness. Um, so I get a different function. It's not even flipped. It's not even a sine flip. So, uh, so the answer is no. Okay, so it's periodic. Um, Let's find the domain. Because what if the domain is empty and then there's nothing to draw? So the domain of cosine is everything. I can plug anything into cosine. I can plug anything into sine. The only thing that could go wrong is that the denominator is zero. Because there's no square roots. There's no logarithms. Um, it's just denominators that could go wrong. So whenever this happens, whenever the denominator is zero, the denominator is going to be zero if the sine of x equals negative two. Now, the sine is the y coordinate, uh, sorry, negative two. So which angle has this y coordinate? No angle. Sine is always between one and negative one. So the domain, so every number is in the domain. And um, and therefore it's continuous everywhere because all these functions are continuous in their domain, including division. Okay, not much to draw so far. 
Uh, intercepts. I'm only going to do the x intercept it's, if it's easy. I don't think it's worth it if it's hard. But, but, um, but let's do the, the good one first the y intercept. You just plug in zero. Cosine of zero is one. Sine of zero is zero. So it goes through a zero one half. Okay, I got absent to draw now. So let's draw it. Let's see, I'm gonna make five squares. Really? No, really I should I should put my I, I should put bias in my scale. Okay, let's say three squares. I repeat. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. This is going to be five fourths. No, five halves. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. So whatever I draw between these two points, it's just going to repeat over and over. Uh, for example, so pi over two, well, this is, I can use different scales in the, in the X and Y axis, nobody's, nobody's gonna stop me. So I know the graph goes through this point. So I also know it goes through this point and the same is gonna be true all the way over here. And so on. Um, and honestly, I'm gonna do something easy, which is plug in some more, plug in some more points. And cosine, divided by two plus sine. So just, where is pi? Pi is here, which makes the cosine negative one and the sine zero. Negative one divided by two, all right? Negative one half. So at pi, we are down here. And the same is true here. Um, there's a power two just because it's ones and zeros. F of pi over two, so pi over two is here, makes the makes the cosine zero and the sine one. Oh, that's great. Um, this is zero. <clears throat> and that makes me want to do negative pi over two because it also has cosine zero. Well, the denominator is one this time, who cares? Okay, so we accidentally found the x intercepts, I think. Oh, I definitely miscounted there. No, I right, problem solved. This is the, the axis, I'm just. Um, so we're going through zero here. Could it be that I'm just drawing a zigzag? Maybe. One, two, three, four, five. All right, should have made the scale bigger. <clears throat> I think maybe I'll we'll still go around and do that. Okay, let's find the x-intercepts and see if we found them all. So that means you wanna make y equals zero. 
So you find you want to find the x as well, which this is this is zero. So we're going to solve for x. If we solve for x, well, that denominator we we already established that it's never going to be zero. So we can happily multiply it out. I mean, if it was zero, that was going to be undefined anyway. So that's just when cosine of x is zero, which we already said is pi over two. Um, and then it repeats every two pi. I don't need to find, well, that's what every angle with that cosine is. But also I could just find the solutions in any given interval of length two pi, and I know it's going to repeat. Okay, so I found the x-intercept. Um, asymptotes is the next thing in the list, which again, you don't have to go through the whole thing, but might as well. This is, this is very easy. Uh, there cannot be any vertical asymptotes because the function is continuous everywhere. And what about horizontal? Also none. How can I approach, it can't approach a horizontal line if it repeats. Um, we've, we've already seen that it takes all of these values. Um, So these values are just gonna keep repeating. And if you're jumping between one half negative one half and zero, you're, you can't, there's no value that you can approach. None of those and none other values. Wait, so that was easy. Um, all right, here's the interesting part. Here's the fun. And it's increasing and decreasing. I guess we, we already accidentally also found where it's positive and negative because we know where it crosses the axis. We know it can't cross it anywhere else. And in each of the intervals, we found a positive or a negative value. So, wait. So, increasing, as we know, means that the derivative is positive, and decreasing means that the derivative is negative. So we're gonna find the derivative. The derivative is the derivative of this whole thing. And that's a quotient. And I really, I don't know of a way of making, I always think of simplifying before taking the derivative, trying to make my life easier, but I, I don't know how to, get, how to make this any simpler. So the square of the denominator, which I'm gonna swiftly ignore, because it's a square, it's positive, and it's never even zero. I already said that. The denominator, in brackets, everything has to be in brackets, otherwise you just write the derivative of the numerator. The numerator, in brackets, just in case, and the derivative of the denominator. So now let's just do it. Look at this. Oh no, I thought I could copy and paste. I'm just, I'm just, oh, oh so sad. It's gonna be, it's gonna be glorious. Okay, so I'm, I'm copying and pasting the old fashioned way, which is reading and reproducing. Okay, so there's no derivative here, I'm not doing anything. The derivative of cosine is negative sine minus that cosine doesn't really need brackets. Um, and the derivative of two is zero and the derivative of sine is cosine. So let's simplify this before we try to do stuff to it. Negative two sine x minus 
sine squared of x minus, interesting, cosine squared of x. So I really hope when you see a sine squared next to a cosine squared, you have a voice in your head screaming one. The sum of the sine squared and the cosine squared is just one. Life is that good. Minus one. And then there's some denominator, which who cares? It's just. Um, it's just a square. It's always positive. So, so this is the derivative. I've computed it. I've simplified it. And, and where is it positive? Well, it's continuous everywhere. Um, because that denominator is never going to vanish, as we've already seen. So we can only change signs if it's zero. So let's see where it's zero. Or let's write down what I just said. It is continuous everywhere. Because that denominator is always positive. Um, so it can only change signs. The intermediate value theorem says that the only way for it to change signs is at a critical point, at a point where it crosses the axis. So let's solve, let's find those points. When do we have that this is true? Uh, well, that fraction is going to be zero when the denominator is zero, like all fractions. When the numerator is zero, sorry. Well, if the denominator is zero, that is not zero, that is trouble. Um, you could multiply both sides by the denominator if you wanted to get here. Or you could cross multiply, think of that fraction as zero divided by one. But anyway, on the, on the left, you're gonna have a multiplication by zero. And now we can solve this. Uh, add one to both sides, divide both sides by negative two, and now we have sine of x equals negative one half. Oh my god, what is that? When sine of x equals negative one half. Well, one half, that's one of the signs I I know the sine of uh, 30 degrees is one half, but I can just draw a really good picture. And is there, don't tell me, is there a circle tool? All right, there's a circle. <clears throat> so here's a circle, and here's y equals negative. Okay, but I can draw on it. This is y equals negative one half. And for any given sine or cosine, except for one and negative one, you expect to see two angles. And it's these two. So I know because I've studied my stuff that the sine of pi over six is six is one half. Um, and based on this picture, the sine, why, why? The sine of negative pi over six is negative one half. And if I want to get the same sign for another angle, um, I can well, look at the picture. I have it's it's 180 plus pi over six. 
180, which is pi. This is another pi over six. This is pi and added together, it's seven pi over six. So the derivative is zero if, and only if there's no other points. Um, if we are pi over six at seven pi over six or uh, these plus a multiple of two pi. Um, we really only need to care about one of these intervals. Um, because, um, because it repeats. If a function is periodic, it's derivative, it's also periodic. So um, I guess between, between these, so what I have is pi over six, seven pi over six, then this one plus two pi, which is 13 pi over six. And, and really only two intervals to care about. And to figure out if the derivative is zero or not. <clears throat> so let's just let's just plug in something and see what we get. For example, zero. Seven pi over six is going to be negative five pi over six, which is this angle. Um, a prime of zero. Well, the derivative that I just computed is negative two sine minus one divided by two plus sine squared. And given that sine of zero is zero, that is negative one fourth. So over here, the derivative is negative. because here's where zero is. And here I have pi, so let's just compute the derivative of pi. Well, um, I do have pi, right? Yeah. Wait, this, oh. It was negative pi over six. Oh. Negative pi over six. All right, let's just. Let's try again and try to copy what we do correctly. So if we, so it's negative pi over six, seven pi over six, and then multiples of two pi. So if this is zero, here's negative pi over six, and then there's eight of these, two, three, four. No, that was a mistake. Here's negative pi over six. And then we have, Pi over three, pi over three, pi, seven pi over six. And now one, two, three, four, we have 13 pi over six, and here we have two pi. So there's two things that are, there's two intervals that keep repeating. There's this one, and there's this one. And then whatever happens after is just, it's just the same thing repeated over and over.
So f prime of zero, I, I did that correctly. It's um, what was the formula? For the derivative, negative two sine minus one divided by two plus sine squared. Negative two sine zero minus one divided by two plus sine zero squared, which is negative one fourth, which is negative. So here the derivative is negative. And since it repeats also here and also here. And now pi is in the same interval. Oops. Um, so I know I'm going to get some negative there. So I got to pick something between these two. Um, for example, all the midpoint, right? Three pi over two. The derivative of three pi over two is negative two sine three pi over two minus one divided by two plus sine three pi over two. Now what the what is this sign? Three pi over two is three quarters of a turn. Uh, the cosine is zero, the sign is negative one. So two minus one divided by one squared, which is one, which is positive. So on the red parts, the derivative is positive and on the blue parts is negative. Um, let's, let's, draw, let's draw that in. So, pi over two. So, pi over six is a third of pi over two. Probably here, right? And then there's seven pi over six, which is a third past this one, which is on like here. And then it's more or less the same again. 13, no, not, not 13, 11. Okay, so this from here to here is the red interval that I was drawing before. And from here to here, it's the uh, there is a red, it's a blue, and then the red interval. Um, here the derivative is we said negative, so the function is decreasing. Here the derivative is positive, so the function is increasing. And then this pattern just repeats. So, well, I'm not gonna draw it just yet, but it has to go downhill all the way down up to here and then go uphill. So, I mean, I, it's a, probably a pretty accurate picture. <clears throat> I might as well find what's happening at the two special points where, where to plot a point. Um, so let's do that. Uh, what's the function at pi over six and negative pi over six? The function was cosine negative pi over six divided by two plus sine negative pi over six. Uh, negative pi over six. Well, it's in the previous circle, right? It's here. The sine is negative one half, and the cosine is root three over two. Because the cosine doesn't care about the sine, uh, the, the cosine doesn't care about the plus or minus. It's the same as the cosine of pi over six, which I know by heart. So this is root three over two divided by two plus negative one half. Uh, so let's go, let's go simplify this. Multiply and divide by two because I don't like denominators. Root three divided by four minus one. Root three over three, or one over root three. What is the square root of one third?
I'm going to go with two thirds. I think it's going to be pretty accurate. Two thirds, when you square that, you get four divided by nine, which is kind of like three divided by nine. Yeah. So I guess it's a bit smaller than two thirds. So, so pretty much why I drew this. And here we go again to the same place. And how about the other one? How about seven over six? Seven, five over six. So the cosine is gonna be, it's gonna be the same sign and the opposite cosine. Um, because we're looking at this angle, We've, which you know we chose it because of its sign, and the cosine is negative root three, negative root three over two. So I guess the answer is just negative the other one, negative the previous one. I'm not going to do the same thing again. I just did this. Uh, this is the same thing, but with a minus in front. So um, where we are now is here we are opposite, which is, I guess, here. And then somewhere, somewhere here. Somewhere here. Oh, I was sorry, the dots were, were red. Okay, so. <clears throat> right. What else? We're going to see where it's. Um, Maxes and mins. If you know that where it's increasing or decreasing, then you just need to figure out where it changes. What does the derivative change signs? We already figured that out um, at pi over six, negative pi over six, and seven pi over six. Um, because what we established is that between negative pi over six and seven pi over six, the derivative was negative and then the derivative was positive up to the next repetition, and then negative again. So if it goes from negative to positive, well, I don't remember which way, which is which, but it, it's going down then up and drawing that uh, is clear that what I'm looking at is a local min. And the other one is going from first going up, then going down. It's a local max. Um, are, they, are they global maxes and mins? What do you think? Are you, are you oh. what do you think? Um, exactly. Great job. Um, they have to be. They have to be because um, there has to be a, a global maximum in. Say, on zero to pi by the extreme value theorem. Or, you know, in any zero, 100 pi or negative pi over six, uh, seven pi over six plus 100 pi. Any, any, as long as it's not, the bounds are not infinite, 
and and then this max is going to be the global max just because it repeats um so these are the global maxes and mints i mean just like the picture suggests um i'm hitting the the highest points here and the lowest points here and i can't really there's no way i'm gonna go any lower or higher because i'm just repeating all right and finally the curvature In other words, the sign of the second derivative. Um, if it's positive, it's curving up. If it's negative, it's curving down. Let's see. The derivative, the first derivative was negative two sine x minus one divided by two plus sine x squared. So this might be painful. The second derivative I don't like this. I don't like I don't like having to do this. I'm gonna do logarithmic differentiation. Which just means I'm gonna take logs on both sides and take the derivative because it's gonna be a fourth power in the denominator, but really it's gonna be a third power because there's gonna cancel with something on the top. I don't wanna to go through that whole thing. Um, if I just call the function y, and I take logarithms on both sides, then I have the logarithm of a fraction which is um, which simplifies a bunch. Logarithms uh, turn divisions into subtractions. If you ever wanna do a division, what you should be doing is taking logarithms and subtracting. Um, pull out your old logarithm book like the ancients, um, so I said subtraction and I wrote a plus. And then there's a, there's a, a squaring there. And the logarithms turn powers. Well, I mean, that's just like multiplying and, and it turns a multiplication into a sum. If I'm gonna sum a thing to itself, I'm gonna multiply it by two. And logarithms turn sums into nothing special at all. Okay, so this is where we are. And now we're gonna take the derivative. And the derivative of the logarithm of y is the derivative of a function where I take y first, which is just this whole formula. And then I take the logarithm. So. I compose two functions, I need to use the chain rule. And the derivative, the logarithm, the derivative of the logarithm of anything, this is a pretty useful thing to keep in mind, is the derivative of the outside, which is the derivative of the logarithm applied to the inside. So the derivative of the logarithm is one over whatever, here whatever is f of x, times the derivative of the inside. So it's always just, the derivative divided by the function y prime over y. And the same is true for all the other logarithms. The function in the denominator and its derivative in the numerator. The derivative of sine is cosine. And here there's a two that is just hanging out there. And I have the function in the denominator and its derivative in the numerator. So I can solve for y prime by just multiplying by y.
Oh, it's like going back through there and everything. Oh, wait. So that's the function. It's kind of, I mean, it's kind of messy, but what are you gonna do? Because I can plug in, I can plug back Y in here. Why was this function? Um, negative two sine x minus one divided by two plus sine x squared. And then I should really pull out that negative two cosine x that's everywhere. And I'm gonna be left with this whole thing. Ooh. All right, well, that's, that's the second derivative, I guess. The second derivative is a product of a bunch of things then. It's a product of this square, which is always positive. So I'm gonna go ahead and ignore it. Then, well, then there's two minus signs, which I just wanna cancel out. Then there's two sine x plus one, which we've already figured out the sign of. Um, it's positive between negative pi over six and seven pi over six, and negative in the other places. And then there's two cosine x. Oh, that two is not doing anything. And then there's negative one divided by this whole thing. And I pull the negative out and then minus one divided by sine x plus two, right? So I haven't factored it out. I'm gonna go and not multiply it um, because I'm, I wanna see, I wanna see where it's, um, where it's positive and negative. And the best thing to do is just to see where each of the factors has which sign and then multiply those signs <laughs> together. So, um, so this one is always positive. Two sine x plus one. Um, we've already done this. Uh, it changes sign if the sine of x is negative one half, which means x is negative pi over six or x is seven pi over six. Um, between negative pi over six and seven pi over six, I have, for example, zero, where the sign is zero. So this is positive. And then it's uh, negative. Somewhere in there, at three pi over two, the sign is negative one. All right. Cosine changes sign at x equals pi over two and, and negative pi over two. Cosine doesn't care about that plus minus. And So negative pi over two, here it's positive pi over two, and then it's negative. Uh, cosine of 180 is negative one. And then it repeats. And finally, this whole thing. Woo. 
Well, first of all, it might change sign. Um, if this vanishes, um, that function is not continuous. And though I guess it's going to cancel with the other stuff. Maybe I should have combined those two. Maybe I should have used the Gaussian rule. Maybe I get too excited by the um, arithmetic differentiation. Okay. I'm going to combine these two. So I'm going to write the derivative. Oh, this is why it's I I delete. That's the way of copying and pasting. Right. So if we combine those two, I get the leftovers. So this is always positive. This I already figured out. And then I have negative one minus two sine x plus one divided by sine x plus two, which is nice because that's continuous. So when is this function positive and negative? Let's figure out where it's zero first. This is zero if this fraction is it's one. Negative sine x plus one divided by sine x plus two equals one. I hope I didn't make a sign error. Um, and I can multiply by that denominator very happily. It's not, it's never zero. So what we get is two sine x equals negative three. Uh, that's not that's not I don't know how that works. Um, oh boy. Oh, we're wrong. Let me think for a second. The answer is nothing went wrong. So sine is never negative three halves. Um, sine is bigger than negative one. So this whole thing is always the same sign. For example, if I plug in zero, well, I get a negative number. Um, this is always negative. This is always positive. So what I'm left over with is just cosine. The opposite sign. Well, it has the same sine as negative cosine, which is negative and then positive and then negative again. So again, it's because I, this is a square, this is positive. This, well, when you combine these, so, here, it's a square. This is always negative because we've just seen, trying to solve it never crosses the axis. And what I'm left with is cosine. It's the only thing that could do something. Uh, so it's the opposite of cosine because there's one negative. So there you go. So the derivative is negative here. So it curves down, then it curves up, then it curves down. And we're 
in the middle, it changes signs. Um, so pi over two, and then every pi, I get an inflection point. All right. <clears throat> so pi over two, all of these are pi over two, three pi over two. All of these are inflection points, which I'm not I'm gonna draw properly, but here it goes. Uh, so here I'm supposed to, I could find the derivative there to be more accurate, but it's supposed to be curving down. Ugh, I ruined it already. It's supposed to have a max here and then be going down. And here's where it changes curvature. Although it's kind of hard to draw. And then here it has a max. And it repeats. And that's it. Uh, no, I mean, the fun part is, is plotting it and, and seeing how wrong you were or correct, I don't know. That's really good. I even got the color down and everything. Negative pi over six, zero, one half, exactly the points I knew I should care about. Uh, this picture is much more clearly an inflection point. All right, congratulations. You are now an expert in functions. All right. Like and subscribe.